job, everybody. Would you do me a big favor before we jump into the Word of God? Would you help me to say a big hello to our Bell Chase campus worshiping with us today? You're joining us online because you were afraid of the rain. I want you to know we got some amazing people in the house today. Would you give yourself a good hand? Come on, you overcame the weather, showed up in the house of God. I'm so proud of you and really excited to continue our series today that we've simply titled Jesus is dot dot dot. We're jumping into really defining and reminding ourselves of the importance of Jesus as we head towards Resurrection Sunday. I'm looking forward to celebrating the King of Kings with you on that day. Lots of great things happening, but today as we continue this series, I want to invite you to read our key verse, Every Voice, Bell Chase, Paris Avenue. It's on screen right now. Here's what it says. Come on, read it. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's a very straightforward verse. Take some boldness for somebody to look at you and say, I am the way, the truth, the life. And you know who could do that? Jesus could do it. Amen, everybody? He embodied the way. He embodied the truth. He embodied the life. And last week, as we began this series, we said this verse is going to be our simple outline just for three weeks. The first week, we said Jesus is the way. The way he does things is very different than the way we would do them on our own. I like to say it this way, that many of us want the works of God, but few of us want to do things the way God would do them. And Jesus exampled the way. Can I get a good amen from everybody today? He exampled the way for us to live our lives. Now today, we're going to continue this series with simply going into the same verse, same outline. Jesus is not only the way, Jesus is the truth. I'm going to challenge some of you to think differently about your religion, to think differently about your faith and your connection to God. We've said this year, 2024, as a church family, is a year that we're going to grow spiritually. It's a year that we're going to challenge ourselves to grow in greater ways and to overcome some of the things that have been holding us back. I'll say to you at the beginning of today's message, I'm going to meddle a little bit, okay? And so if you've got a seatbelt, it's time to put it on right now, all right? Because Jesus is the truth. And if you're going to mature in 2024, the truth is going to have to replace your truth. The truth is going to have to become the predominant voice of your life. It's going to have to become everything to how you make decisions. So before we go too much further, since this is under such debate in our culture, let's define it. Come on, take some notes with me. Grab the message notes out of the seat backs. Write some things down or download them at onehopechurch.com if you like. The word truth in the original language of the Bible is the word aletheia. And it literally means objectively what is true in any matter under consideration. Can I say that one more time? objectively what is true in any matter under consideration. Dictionary.com says it's the actual state of a matter and adherence to reality or an indisputable fact. Today, Jesus is indisputable. Jesus is the truth. Not only is he represented in biblical history, but in every historical account in society, you can find references to Jesus living, dying, resurrected, and changing the world. The famous historian Josephus says they refer to him as Christos, the Christ, and many miracles followed him everywhere that he went. His life, you can find that Jesus is there and present in our history. But so many of us have We've allowed culture to define things. We've allowed culture to determine our ways. And today, I'm here to help course correct just a little bit to challenge you to lean into the reality that Jesus is the truth. In John chapter 1, the apostle, who was very, very close to Jesus, spent time with him, walking, talking. One place, he said that he loved him so much that he laid his head upon his chest. Here's how John described Jesus John chapter 1, verse 1, this is how he begins 
his historical account of God. Let's read it together. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Next five words, every voice, full of grace and truth. This passage is all about Jesus. He was there in the beginning. He became flesh, so he knows what you're going through. Isn't that a comforting thought that Jesus, he he went through the same life that you and I are going through, that he had to mourn friends who died. He had to go through hardship. He struggled. He faced hardship like we did and yet overcame it. I also like that the Bible says he's full of grace and truth. Do you know what that means? He's not running out, y'all. When I was growing up, whenever you said something you shouldn't say, somebody might say, well, you're full of it. You're making up stuff. The Bible says that he is full of grace and truth. The weather is saying amen to us right now. (laughs) And if you should get dripped upon, this 75-year-old building sometimes reminds us that it's 75, brand new roof, y'all, and sometimes it drips, okay? So don't be concerned. The ushers will help you find another place. And the church said, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to keep on going because I'm just going to take every lightning and thunder as God's saying amen to the message. Can we do that? Jesus is the truth. And John says that he's full of grace and truth. So he embodies all of the truth that we need in order to live our lives. Can I say it to you this way? He is the embodiment of grace and truth. So there's no separation between who he is and what is true. Truth, though, is at the center of almost every cultural debate today. But somehow Jesus had a way of speaking truth in every context. Regardless of who he was speaking to, he could tell them the truth but somehow say it in a way that they wanted it. Don't you love that? Can we redeem that in our culture? Instead of everybody preaching it to you and screaming it at you and telling it to you, could we come with a little bit of grace? Amen, everyone, right? Can we bring a little bit of grace and civility to the conversation? Jesus had a way of doing this. But since there is such cultural debate in our day, I want to say to you very, very clearly, in probably the top five or so areas that we are debating, That Jesus is very, very clear, and the Bible is very, very clear, speaking to what we should believe and what we should do. Write these areas down with me. Here's the first that the Bible and Jesus speaks to clearly. Number one, Jesus speaks to the definition of our family. Every study of the most successful family unit matches the biblical description of a family. The biblical family unit is made up of a man and a woman producing children in the world. Culture says today that a family can be a mixture of anything you want, but today I want you to know very clearly that you still need a man, and that's seed, and you still need a woman and an egg to produce life in this world. And that's the way God designed it. It's not up for debate. There is no new science. I know they're clapping in Bell Chase right now. (laughs) I was talking to a young person this week, and we are talking a little bit about family, and we are talking about kind of the roles and all those things, and uh, they looked at me, just a young kid, just said, you know what, it's kind of amazing to me that the animals aren't confused about this, Dad. Listen, as we go further into this world, we're going to have people saying all sorts of things. We've got to be the voice that comes back and says, no, no, no. There is clear truth about these things. He defines the family. We shouldn't be angry about it. We should be full of grace and truth when we talk to people. But here's the deal. We should also not give in to the reality. Here's the second. We're meddling a little further today. The Bible and Jesus speaks clearly the truth about gender and sexuality. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says that God made mankind in his image. Man and woman, he created them. There is clear, 
truth regarding gender in Scripture. And science has echoed this truth as it has discovered what God has created, that he created a man and a woman in the beginning. And he said that both of us were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Don't you love that? I tell my wife that all the time. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. She says that I was fearfully made and she was wonderfully made. (laughs) The Bible is very, very clear. And if you need to take some time, I would encourage you to study the subject matter in the historical context of the Word of God and allow that truth to speak to you. We are being told today that our gender is a social construct that's holding us back when gender and healthy sexuality are actually the only pillars upon which a society can flourish. If you take genders out of the equation, our society will collapse. You take the family out of the equation, our society will collapse. Study history. Every society that has removed gender, sexuality, and family has collapsed rapidly. The reason I'm speaking so clearly about this today for you and to you is because I believe that we can stave off a collapse. Amen, everybody? That we can be a society that continues to honor God. And I think that's why America, for now over 200 years, has lasted longer than almost any other dynasty because it was founded upon biblical values. It was not founded upon forcing you to be a Christian. It was founded upon a biblical value, a standard that we can live on that would hold us together because they knew that in order for us to succeed, we needed objective truth. Jesus speaks to the family. Jesus speaks to gender and sexuality very clearly. How about this one? Number three, Jesus speaks to racism and the value of life. Some of us think the issues of the past are over concerning racism, but can I just say we still have work to do in this area. And it's not just in America, it's in every nation in the world. There is a devaluing of life. There is a devaluing of anyone that is not you. It's kind of interesting, like we want to herd a bunch of us together that kind of look the same, smell the same, have the same amount of money, go the same way. We want to act like we're a special club and we want to push everybody else out. Can I just tell you that that is not new in the world. That has always been what the devil is about. He wants to divide and conquer. Pastor, you brought the devil into this. That got serious right there. Yeah, 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 I did. It's evil in the world. Racism is ungodly. Can I get a great amen in this room? It is ungodly. It is not at the heart of God. We are all made in the image of God. Men and women, every race, every color, every background, we are representing his beauty in the world. But in the same way that racism is wrong, the way that we've devalued life in the womb is wrong. Racism is ungodly, and abortion is taking a life. Here's what I would say to you if you're like, well, Pastor, I'm not really sure. Let me just say it to you this way. There are better options than abortion in the world, and we as Christians should provide better options so that better choices can be made. We shouldn't say to someone that's fallen prey to someone else or fallen and made a mistake or discovered that they're in a harsh place in life. We shouldn't say, you're on your own. Go figure it out. We should help them to follow God. Amen, everybody. We should be there to support and carry rather than saying, this is your only way out. Some of y'all like, Pastor, it's raining outside. I really was thinking I was coming in for sunshine and rainbows. Sorry. Today's message really will be sunshine and rainbows when you allow it to come into your heart and life. Jesus speaks to the family. He speaks to gender and sexuality. He speaks to racism and the value of life. How about this one, number four? He speaks to government and politics. Pastor, you're bringing up everything today. Everything at the dinner party they say don't bring up. They say don't talk about sex, money, and politics, and you're doing all of it today. I am. Y'all still love me today. Yeah, seven of you. Thank you. (laughs) Government and politics is supposed to look like the people, not the other way around. But somehow we've allowed our politics to inform our faith rather than our faith inform our politics. We've let one thing, as my dad would say growing up, we're letting the the tail wag the dog instead of the dog wag the tail. We're letting the wrong thing lead the way. 
can I go a little bit further? Because I, I, I feel like I just, every once in a while, I need to help you to grab some language surrounding these things because there's such debate and the church sometimes feels as though we don't know how we should respond. I, I need to make it clear that, that uh, being a Republican doesn't make you a better Christian. And being a Democrat doesn't make you a better Christian. Uh, being independent isn't better than all of them, right? Being black doesn't make you a better Christian. Being white doesn't make you a better Christian. Being brown doesn't make you a better Christian. Y'all are getting quieter and quieter the further I go. Starting to sound like a Methodist church in here. We've allowed our culture to say this is who we are, and that should tell us what we should be as a Christian. When you became a Christian, it supersedes your American identity. When you became a Christian, it supersedes your political party. Can I go further? When you became a Christian, it supersedes your race. When you became a Christian, it supersedes that you're white or you're black or you're brown because you were adopted into God's family. You are no longer identified as those things first. You are identified as a child of God. You are made in the image of God who happens to be white, who happens to be brown, who happens to be brown, who happens to be brought up in a Republican environment or a Democratic environment, who happen to be surrounded with those kind of... That's not who we are. We are children of the Most High God. Your faith should supersede all of those things not the culture with which you grew up in. And our faith should inform those things and challenge those things. We should not become those things. Here's the last one. Write it down with me, and I'm going to help you guys to smile a little bit and relax. The last one, Jesus speaks to defining right and wrong. Right and wrong is not a moving target. It's not changing next week. Lying is still lying. Stealing is still stealing. Adultery is still adultery. It, it is all dishonoring to God. It is all wrong. We have to, ex to understand that the moral standards haven't changed from Old Testament to New Testament. I got a good friend of mine that many years ago, she's on the front row over here. We, we were, we, she was touring us around her college town in Tuscaloosa, and, and, and we were riding together. Carrie was kind of leading us, and, and my wife said, Carrie, you jump in the front since you've lived here for a long time. You navigate for us. And Amber, my wife, jumped in the back, and, and we were driving around Tuscaloosa trying to find her way. And what I didn't know and I didn't realize is that, uh, that Carrie is right and left challenged, y'all. <laughs> she would say, Take a left. Now, all of y'all, that's left. But when we we're facing the same direction, she would say, take a left. And I would start going this way. She's like, no, no, the other left. And I looked at her and said, listen, how have you gotten this confused? Left is left and right is right. Y'all hearing this? But somehow in the process of society, we've we started moving what is right and wrong, and we started subjectively saying what it should be rather than objectively saying this is true. And when someone says to you, I just I, I'm just following my truth, you need to say that's very subjective. Because that wasn't your truth three years ago, and that wasn't your truth five years ago. So what's your truth gonna be in ten years? If truth isn't founded upon something that's objective, it's always going to be moved by emotion. It's always going to go in a certain direction. So where does right and wrong come from? Is truth an individual decision? And if so, where's the line? You have a line today. How many of y'all have at least one thing in your life you would say is wrong? Come on, show me this hand. One thing you say, that's wrong, that's wrong. Everybody, everybody has, you have a line. But here's what happens to us. The longer we dance on the line, the blurrier the line gets. And then all of a sudden what used to be a clear demarcation is kind of blurry. So then we find ourselves on the other side and we pick a new line. I said, well, I'm not going to do that. Never thought I'd do that, but now I'm doing, oh, that wasn't, and then the line just keeps going. If there isn't an objective standard, here's the objective standard, Jesus. 
He's the objective standard. The Bible changes not. The word of God is fixed so historically sound, we can trust its boundaries as the standard of our lives. But if we allow it to be subjective, it keeps creeping, creeping, creeping right along. Every healthy society needs objective standards, not subjective ones. Many years ago, when we were moving back home from Birmingham to plant the church here in New Orleans, I had our launch team, a, a bunch of the people that are on our staff now for many, many years, about 10 people raised their first year's income and moved to New Orleans to help us plant One Hope Church. Can y'all help me honor them real quick? Come on. Pretty amazing, right? Many of us left full-time jobs and other ministries and other environments and said, we're just going to, we're doing this. And so in November of 2013, I brought them here because we were going to launch in 2014. We came for Thanksgiving and I said, you know what, I'm going to drive probably six or seven of you around. We're going to go check out the city. I'm going to show you, show you the beautiful areas, but I'm going to show you some real areas too, right? We're, we're going to see all of New Orleans and we were, we were in downtown, we were in the Ninth Ward, we were, we, were, we were everywhere. And I was taking them out towards Metairie a little bit and I said, we found ourselves at the, y'all know the Causeway Airline Roundabout. Anybody been on the Causeway? So, and I just said, we're just going to keep on going. I just kept on going around. Jackie got so sick. She was like, stop it. Get me out of here. And, and while I was making the, probably the third or fourth trip around, I said, oh, they need to get on, they need to experience the Huey P. Long Bridge. Now, if you've moved to New Orleans in the last few years or so, uh, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you've been around here for a lot, how many of y'all remember the original Huey P. Long Bridge, right? It started out, if you're unfamiliar, it started out as a train bridge. And, and, and somewhere in the process, they said, we think we can add cars to it too. And so they started, they said, we're going to build the bridge to go faster. We're going to start from both sides. Well, they misjudged. And when the bridge came together, they were off by a couple of feet. And in the middle of the bridge, there was this little dog leg, right? You had to make sure you were paying attention because you might run into the rail at the dog leg. Not only was the train bridge off a little bit, their idea to add cars was to put some kickers on the side of the bridge and put two lanes on the outside. Huey P. Long Bridge was so tight when you were driving across, you could reach out and touch the car without even extending your arm. Heaven forbid you pass an 18-wheeler. Bridge in the middle was a train. You're out here hanging out in no man's land. When we were kids, my sisters were so scared that when we get to the bridge, they would lay down on the floor of the van. And at the dog leg, my brother would go, we're going over. <laughs> and my sisters would scream. It's what brothers are made for. Can you imagine with me what it would have been like to get on that bridge with no rails? Just imagine with me. Dog leg coming. Be careful, don't get in the right lane. Because if you're on the edge, there's nothing keeping you on the bridge. That is a beautiful picture of what subjective truth is. Subjective truth is driving across a bridge with no railing and thinking you're going to make it to the other side. You can't do it. We need a standard. We need a protection. We need something that holds us on the bridge. We need objective truth. That's why we as a church hold the Bible high and Jesus high. See, the divinity of Jesus is clearly seen in that he speaks truth to the most important issues of our day. He hasn't retracted himself. He hasn't stepped back. No, no. He has from the beginning been defining these things for us. So what should we do with him? Well, I think we should learn from him. I think we should, we should look to him as being the ultimate expression of truth for our lives. So is your family struggling with issues that you don't have answers for today? Is your son or daughter coming home from school saying things that don't make sense and you're wondering how to answer them? Today, parents... Fathers, mothers, grandparents, leaders, young people, we need to bring ourselves back to the reality of who Jesus is to our lives. Listen to how Jesus described us and what he wanted for us. Matthew chapter 13 and 52. And Jesus said to them, 
Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Team, leave it up on the screen just for a moment. I'd love for you to write down four words out of this verse. I've underlined them. I'd like you to write down the word scribe, the word disciple, the word head of a household, and treasure. Write those three, four words down, four, four descriptions. Uh, you're a scribe, a disciple, a head of a household, and treasure. If you're wondering how to answer the questions Jesus said to them, when a scribe becomes a disciple, what was a scribe? In their day, there were no printing presses. You couldn't hit print, kids. You couldn't just say, just put that out there. They had to have someone that was skilled with, with pen and ink and paper, and they literally had to write every single word in Scripture out. So if you wanted a copy of the Old Testament, somebody was like, they were writing for a long time. And they did not allow typos in their day, just like I do not allow typos in my day. If they had one word that was misprinted, they didn't strike it out and keep on going. They threw the entire page away. Anybody want this job? Talk about cramps in your hands. You know, to add upon that, a scribe had to throw away a pen before they ever wrote the name of God. They had to use a new pen every time they wrote the name of God. You realize the stack of pen and paper they needed in order to to describe the Bible. What that would produce is a person that was so knowledgeable concerning God's word that when you asked them, they could recite it to you. What's Genesis 1-1 say? In the beginning. What's John 1-1 say? In the beginning. They could take you from Romans. They could take you to every book of the Old Testament. Can you imagine the scribe who had to write down the book of Leviticus? If you don't know, you don't know. He says when the scribe becomes a disciple of the kingdom. What does that mean? When when someone begins to understand that it's not just truth, a disciple of the kingdom is is full of grace too. A disciple of the kingdom looks like Jesus, acts like Jesus. You begin to be a disciplined learner of the way God would do things, not just going through the motions. He says when a scribe becomes a disciple of the kingdom, they become a head of a household. Do an old school Bible study right now. A head of a household was a generational patriarch where four generations would live on the same property with them And there was our grandfather. Some of y'all have a hard time living with your parents. Can you imagine if you lived with your grandparents too? They didn't all live in the same house, but they lived on the same property. And when you were a head of a household, you were responsible for generational leadership. Today, I believe that God has called us to be scribes who are disciples of the kingdom, who are generational leaders, who are heads of the household, who are making sure that the youngest and the eldest are taken care of. And the ones in the middle, the manpower, the money, the energy, are working together to bring the kingdom of God to this world. He says, when you understand those three things, you've got treasure. Everybody say, treasure, treasure. You've got treasure. You bring forth things new and old that are treasure. You know the best of the Old Testament and the best of the New Testament. You know the best, best of the old school music and you've got the best of new school music, right? You've got the best of things brought together. What is the answer to what we need in our society? Is I think that we need to go deeper in our understanding of the Word of God. If this is going to be the year of your spiritual growth, I said it at the beginning, then what? Your truth has to be connected to the truth. And it's time for you to get so much of it inside of you that you can tell the difference between the world's truth and what God says is true. How do we do this? I'm going to give you four action steps real quick, and we're going to close together today. Write it down with me. How do we get this treasure in our lives? Number one, we have to recognize that the Word of God is seed to be planted in our lives. Do you realize that everything the Bible said is actually a seed that you plant in your heart and life, and it is going to bear fruit in your life? 
So if you are struggling with fear, young man or woman in the house of God, you need to plant a verse in that fear that says that God is going to take care of you. Because 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And so every time fear creeps in your life, you've got a planted word of God that contradicts the lie of the enemy. Luke chapter 8 and verse 11 says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word, and the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest in their life. If you'll start planting God's word, something will start growing that you're proud of. If you're going to keep planting everything else, if you look at your life and say, why does anxiety keep growing out of my life? Well, it could be that you've been planting anxious thoughts rather than planting the Word of God. I want you to start planting what the Bible says about your anxiety and allow that to grow on the inside of you. Let that be the fruit that's produced in your life. Isaiah 55 and 11 says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. What does that verse say? If you plant the word of God, it'll grow. If you plant the word of God, it'll grow. If you're a mom in the room today and you're trying to do the family thing on your own, I want you to know that we see you and that this family is here for you. But if you're looking at your son or daughter that seemingly is going the wrong way, plant the word of God. Drive the stake in the ground. Hold on to the word of God. I've been telling my kids since they could understand anything. I've been saying to them, we don't do what everybody else does. We do what the Bible says. Amen, everybody? We hold that as the part of our lives. Number number two, write it down with me. The word of God is seed to be planted. The word of God is sustenance to the soul. So you got to do everything you can to get as much of it into your life. So you need to start listening to worship. You need to start listening to teaching and preaching. Many of you don't know that One Hope podcast is available in every platform. You can listen to me on Tuesday and Wednesday. Some of y'all are laughing right now, but it's okay. Um, The word of God. Is seed to be planted, but it's sustenance. Matthew 4, 4 says, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. When you get hungry on the inside, where do you go to fill that hunger? Well, today, if you're like me, you've probably tried almost everything else. I stand before you now, 26 years of pastoring, a few more than that following God. And you know what I found? The only thing that fills your soul is God. Psalm 54 and 4. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. Psalm 94 and 19. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. Psalm 107 and 9, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He has filled with what is good. Today, the promise of God's word is that if you'll plant that seed in your life, it'll grow good things. And in the growth of those good things, it will be sustenance to your life. Every step of faith is going to require some sort of spiritual sustenance. Every verse then is like a meal, and every prayer is like a shot of caffeine to your soul. You need to do as much of it as possible. So you need to get the Bible into your life. You need to start reading the one-year Bible. You've got to allow it to feed who you are. Number one, it's seed. Number two, it's sustenance. Number three, the Word of God is the standard to be followed. I've said it like this for a long time. I'm not going to stop saying it. Where the Bible is clear, that's what we believe. Where the Bible is unclear, we look for principles. If there are no principles, then I'm okay with finding and having a discussion, and you can have opinions there. But there is a lot that the Bible is clear on. It is clear and concerned how we should vote. It is clear in how we should involve ourselves in politics. It is clear about the family. It is clear about gender and sexuality. It is clear. It is clear. It is clear. The question is, are you going to it to inform your politics 
or are you going to something else? Today, I want it to be the standard to be followed. James chapter 1 says, Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man or woman will be blessed in whatever they do. Listen, we've got to find ourselves holding to the standard. The world is looking for someone to stand up and say, I don't think we should go that way. They're looking for us to be the heads of household that God has called us to be. Can I give you the last one and we close together? Number four, the word of God is the source to light your way. Nowadays, we've been blessed with GPS, and I think it's great. But today, I need to remind you that God's GPS begins with the Bible. If you want to know which direction you should go, you have to begin with what the Word of God actually says, because man's GPS will run you into a weird field in the middle of nowhere. God's GPS will take you to good things. So many say to me, Pastor, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Listen to what Psalm 119 says. If you have the question, Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. If you will start to stay in the well-lit areas, you will get closer to God's plan. You'll discover that you see more of what God has for you because you've gone in the direction that he has called you to. In the olden days before modern GPS, if you were a, a captain of a ship, as you neared land, you would look for what? You would look for the light, right? You would look for the lighthouse, a very tall building that would have light circling so that you would know to head in that direction. But you wouldn't know where you were to turn. You wouldn't know where you were going to dock because you needed the light to get you closer to then know more information. Today, if you'll grab a hold of the Word of God and you'll drive closer, you'll follow the light, it will light your path. And when you get closer, you'll find out more information. You say, oh, Pastor, I'm trying to decide what I should go to college for or whether I should take this internship, whether I should take that residency, whether I should move here, whether I should do that. Listen, get close to the lighthouse. And the closer you are, God begins to open your eyes. And he's like, oh, oh, I shouldn't marry her. I should look for somebody like her. Why? You got closer to God and you knew where to go. It's my favorite book of the Bible. Here's what Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 says. Would you read it with me? Come on, every voice in the room. It says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Today I know it's a challenging message. Maybe today I push right up against your politics or your beliefs or your values or your truth. Today I want you to know that being a Christian means letting go of what you think is right and holding to what God says is right. In that place you find objective truth that challenges us all that we all need to be better that we all need to grow, that we all need to follow God in greater and better ways. Today, I'm challenging you to plant seed, to allow him to bring sustenance to your soul. I'm challenging your standards, but I'm believing that when you do, what you discover is that he is the source of everything you're longing for. Would you bow your heads and pray with me at every location just for a moment? Just for a moment of reflection and prayer, if you're here today, you say, Pastor, that's a strong word. It challenges me. Today I want to encourage you to go deeper into God's word on your own, to consider what you should do next. But I know this much. Today, if you're sensing God's presence, this is your time to make a decision about God. This is your moment to allow him to really be your Savior and your Lord. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, I, I'm not going to embarrass you. I will not ask you to come to the front. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm far from God and I need that saving grace. I need objective truth in my life. Would you whisper this prayer or say these words? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.